I never get tired of that. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to Madison United Methodist Church. Good to see all of you today. Um, let me start with some announcements, and uh, we have a number of them, actually. Um, if you would like to join the book club, the book they're reading uh, and have been reading this summer is The Five Wishes of Mr. Murray McBride by Joe Sippel. They're going to meet again on September the 3rd at 5 o'clock to discuss, and so all are welcome to join them. Uh, if you would like to join or you have any questions, please see Lindsay Paul. Uh, if you have a prayer request for the phone tree, the one call system, uh, you can contact Valerie Vickers or you can contact myself. Our numbers are listed there in the bulletin. Uh, you can also call the church office, uh, 304-369-1262. And uh, let us know. Also, if you need to be added to the phone tree, if you're not on that system, let us know that too. We'll be sure to, to get that in for you. Uh, there's going to be a graveside service for Phyllis Fulton on Saturday, August the 26th at 1 o'clock at the Boone Memorial Park. Uh, that is the first cemetery as you go past Spars Creek on Route 17, Spruce River Road. So again, that is August the 26th. That's Saturday at 1 o'clock. Uh, Children's Minutes and Junior Church are going to resume in September, so it won't be too long for those. Um, there will be a PPRC meeting next Sunday, it's August 20th, immediately following the morning worship in the library. Uh, this is kind of a regular PPR meeting and uh, the first one we've had with me since I've been here. So if you are on the PPRC or however you like to call it, perhaps the SPRC, it's the same committee, um, August the 20th, next Sunday, we're going to meet right after service uh, in the library over here. Today after the service, uh, we're going to have a combined meeting of the admin council, the trustees, and the finance committee. So if you're on any or all of those, uh, please meet us in the library right after the service. Uh, one issue, one vote. So this is just one thing we're talking about. It's about the doors out here. Uh, please come to that meeting if you are on that committee. Uh, that's an important one, and we need you there. So right after the service, uh, the admin, trustees, and finance committees all meeting together in the library over there. Uh, I have a note from, from Patty, and I was here this week when this happened. We, we were going through the school supplies, and, and Patty comes in and says, do you think someone meant to leave a bottle of antacids in here? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, so that's what I said. So maybe it's for the teachers. Um, Depends on how the week is going. But if you dropped off school supplies and you accidentally left a bottle of Tums in the thing and you need them, they are in the office. Just see one of us and we'll get them back to you. Uh, if not, we'll pass them on to whatever teacher we think needs them the most, I guess. <laughs> I do have one other recognition, and, uh, and I'm not going to ask her to come up here, but this happened a while back. In fact, I believe this happened before I was actually the pastor here, and this gift has been sitting in the office for quite a while. Uh, a lot of you know about being certified laity. How many of you have any idea what that means when, my, when I say that? Okay, you can, let me give a brief rundown here. You can be a certified lay servant, and that's a, you take some basic courses about how the United Methodist Church works and some basic theology things. You can move beyond that to a certified lay speaker, and you can be, move beyond that to a certified lay minister. Now, none of that means you have to go pastor churches. Everybody can do that. You can be a certified lay servant and do what you already do around the church, and it's a great thing to do. Um, but we've had a member of the church who has gone all the way through the certified lay 
servant and the certified lay speaker and has all of her paperwork turned in for certified lay minister. And so we should be approving that at charge conference this year, but we want to recognize Janet Farmer uh, for doing that. And so, and Janet, I'm not going to make you climb the stairs, but we do have a gift for you I'm going to bring down. There you go. Congratulations. <laughs> Let me just say, too, if you would be interested in doing any of that, uh, talk to me, talk to, obviously, Janet, talk to Heather. She's a certified lay speaker. Uh, you have a number of other certified lay servants. I think Ken Bolliard is, several others here in the church. Talk to one of them. Talk to me. Um, it's an easy thing to get plugged into, and it's a really fruitful experience. And there is no, you cannot be too young, too old, too anything. So if you're interested at all, uh, talk to one of them, talk to me, and we'll get you connected with the right places. The, the district and the conference have classes and things all the time. So all you have to do is just kind of watch that schedule and figure out when those are. Uh, one last thing, and this is about the conference lay retreat. Um, so for any laity, that's everybody but me. Anybody who would like to go in Somersville this coming weekend, registration closes today. So you still have time if you would like to go. Uh, the, the retreat itself is just $10. The bishop is going to be there. She is going to be doing all of the teaching across the weekend. Great time to connect with some folks from other churches and uh, to hear from our bishop and to get to meet her and know her. And if you've never met her, she's very personable. She's very kind and friendly. And so she's very approachable. So don't be nervous. She's really cool. I think that's about all I have in the way of announcements. And Valerie's got one. So you notice I said that's all I had in the way of announcements. They're... No, you're fine. Take your time. Good morning. Um, I know that um, today was supposed to be the last day for school supplies, but I'm going to extend it till tomorrow because we don't have as many school supplies as we've had in the past. And you know how a lot of people have that dream where they're going to class and they have a test and they're unprepared and it's just a regular nightmare. Well, for a lot of students, it's not a dream or a nightmare. It's real life. They're not prepared. They don't have pencils. They don't have papers. And we just want to make every child in Boone County have a successful year. So it, you can um, bring things tomorrow and um, Nancy and I will be packing them up on Tuesday and getting them out. Thank you, Tom. Right. Thank you. Is that height difference again? Any other announcements that I have missed? I'll just announce back to the show again. Uh, the Arizona Story presents Cole, C O K L, which we all know very well. Um, tonight and the next weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, 8 30 at the amphitheater at the park in London. And it, it's the story of it. it leads up to the Battle of Blair Mountain. And there's actual fire. All right. I know that we went down and saw the last one they did, the, the Marvelous Wonderettes. Did I get it in the right order? I kept calling them the Wondrous Marvelettes for a while there. It's so easy to do. And it was great. And so I'm, I would assume that this, this production is going to be just as high quality. And we want to support those things in our community. Arts and stuff are very important. So uh, we're going to definitely try to get down there and see it at some point over the next couple of weekends. But All right. If there are no other announcements, I don't think there are. But I'm going to ask Kevin to come and have our opening prayer. Good morning. Isn't it a great day? Great place to be. Smiling faces. Continuing friendships with your fellowship. Just like we come here to continue our relationship and our fellowship with God. So let's start it off on the right foot. Let's all open up our hearts. Invite God in, because, you know, this is the church, but here's the church. So, if you'll join with me. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the blessings you've given. We thank you, Lord, that we can come here and relax amongst our brother and sister. But the most important part is we come with great anticipation of being in your presence 
enjoying the fullness that comes with being around you, Lord, as you walk with us, as you're here with us, as the songs that are sung, as the message that comes, that feeds us, that strengthens us, that helps us to be the church you'd have us be, to be the people you'd have us be. So, Lord, bless each and every heart. Fill us, Lord, with your love and your grace and tender mercy. Pour out your healing power upon us and strengthen us, that we would be all that you'd have us be and do all that you'd have us do. For these things, I give you praise, I give you glory, and I give you honor. Amen. 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 Well, stand if you would, and let's continue the spirit of worship and join in singing majesty. Worship his majesty, number 176 in your hymnals. Sing it. We'll sing it through twice. may be seated. I wonder if after that song, if anyone might have a testimony this morning. Something God's been doing. Oh, come on up, Mary. Yes. Well, I'm going to tell you right now. I want to tell you about patience. <laughs> because this past uh, Saturday morning at 9 o'clock, I was supposed to have an auction with Bark. And I loaded a hundred packages of stuff for Bark. Well, Facebook decided they were going to close me down at 12 o'clock. So I had a three hour long auction, so I had to reschedule everything. Not only did I have to do that, but I had to go in and reload every single thing. I had to load every picture, every word. But you know what? It'll be okay. Because I'm patient, and I know that it's needed, and 
I don't know what else to say because I'll tell you yesterday, I was really frustrated about 12.05. I had messages upon messages and um, I just sit there and thought, well, you know, I could cry, but all that's going to do is make my eyes puffy. So I decided to just say, Lord, help me. And right now I've got about a third of it loaded back on and I've got a lot more stuff to put on too. So it'll be even bigger than what I thought it was going to be. So that will be a blessing. So everybody look out for Wednesday at 9 o'clock in the morning through Saturday, 6 o'clock. And let's pray that it all works the way it's supposed to. Amen. Someone else? Yeah, I've got a blessing I'd like to share. Earlier this week, Pastor Robert and I took a road trip to a couple of nursing homes. And we went to see Marva Jean and Betty Grubbs, and you know, and, and it's it's really a pleasure seeing these folks. But but I tell you what, when you when you're talking with them, there's only so much you could say or so much you could talk about. But then if you use the universal language, and that's music, what what a what a blessing that is. Robert played, a, he got on the piano, played a couple solos, you know, and they, they were just kind of watching. They were amazed, and so we started to sing along, and then we started off with. Uh, you are my sunshine, you know, something simple like that. So we, then we end up with some uh, gospel hymns or church hymns. And, and it's amazing how some of the folks that are sitting there just kind of half watching, but the next thing you know, the power of music and the power of God, just they start singing, their, their, their voices ring out with it. And, it, you know, it, it's a, I'm sure it's a blessing for them, but it sure is a blessing for us when we do that. So it, it, we enjoyed it. Yeah, that was a great trip. It was a great day. And, and it is. It's wonderful to see that. It's amazing how God works through that stuff. Someone else? Maybe I should just turn around this way. <laughs> By the way, I've been in Facebook jail, and it's not bad. Their, their beds are soft. The food's pretty good. So I, I take it as a... Personally, I take it as a badge of honor that I've been several times in Facebook jail. Yeah, so. I'm the kind of somebody throws a, a snowball at me, look out, because I'm going to throw one back. This weekend has been, uh, been a lot of work, but it's been a lot of fun. Today is my youngest son's birthday. I get to see him later. Um, this was our 50th high school reunion. I didn't think I was that old, but I am. <laughs> Had people come from all surrounding states and, and Ginger and her sister Ginger Bond came all the way from Texas uh, to be with us. Uh, it's a, quite a testimony to the friendships that we made so long ago. Nothing beats true family and true friends. We all have acquaintances but friends and true family are hard to come by. And we all had a great time. But one day before our reunion was to take place. One of the guys in my class had to call a hospice in. And his name's Bob Holston. And when somebody goes through hospice, you don't know what to do really. Is it good to go visit? Would they take visitors? So we called him and talked to him and Saturday five of us went over to visit him. Had a great time. Laughed and joked told a bunch of lies. <laughs> but he had gone to Ohio State to be operated on, and he was there for 10 days. And his wife said, floor after floor after floor in a hospital, not just adults, but children, were people with cancer. But she said they were so good to us. And one way or another, every day that we were there was a blessing. And that's what Bob said. He's a member of the Bible Center Church over there. He said, Jerry, I know where I'm going. I just know maybe when I'm going to go there, or maybe you don't. But it's just blessed to see you don't have a funeral and you don't say goodbye. You have a celebration of a life well lived. Wow. Yeah. Anyone else? I am going to stop turning around. <laughs> Come on, man. Okay, I'm probably not going to be great at this, but um, this was put on my heart. 
we have Bryson with us this morning, and that kid has been such a huge blessing to mine and James's and mom's life. And I never thought a year ago that I wanted kids. We got plenty of opportunities in the past to be foster parents, and this little one right here has let me know that I am very well capable of being a dad, and that it's gonna be an amazing blessing and journey. So, that's all. Amen. I think you did fine. Anyone else? <laughs> Are y'all here today? We were a blessed choir. Anyone else? <laughs> it's hard to follow that. And oh my gosh, you know, just, I feel that so much. But we've had Kaylee since Saturday last week. Yeah. It's been a blessing to have her. But yesterday we got to go to Praise in the Park. Um, and I tell you, if you guys weren't there, I didn't see any guys out that you weren't and we could have missed you, but you missed a blessing. That was such a, such a warm, you could feel the spirit. Mm -hmm. And I got to see some of my old church family with MLK, the Martin Luther King Jr. male chorus. And I tell you, it, it never ceases to amaze me anytime you hear them. If you've never heard them, go find them and hear them. You cannot listen to them and leave sad, angry, depressed, anything. They will uplift you. But I'm going to embarrass you, Kaylee. I'm sorry. <laughs> but the best part yesterday was during the worship part. There was a praise band there. And we're all, you know, in the moment. And I look over and I see her praising God. It's a blessing because you don't see that in kids her age. She's not afraid to. And this morning, another big step coming up and singing with us. Um, I'm just very blessed to have her in my life. And I know you'll... you'll yeah. Reciprocate that. Yeah. Yeah, she's pretty awesome. She's she's embarrassed to death, but yeah, she's a blessing. You know, we've been we've been praying for my eye. We went back for a week follow up, and the doctor looked at us and said, I don't know how to explain it to you, but you are out of rejection within a week of surgery. And they said, usually it's like six months. So, you know, it's been a blessing. And then we went to see Donna for Willow's appointment. And she looked at me and said, can I just look at your eye? I want to see it, <laughs> you know, and it's opening up on its own. And <laughs> But, you know, I just want to thank the church for their prayers through this. Amen. I'm sure Bryson didn't have anything he wanted to share there. <laughs> By the way, kids in worship is awesome. Like, that's one of my favorite things in the world. So if you happen to have child, grandchild who is little, and you bring them to worship, and they start making noises and whatever else, it's not going to bother me. It's one of my favorite things. Don't even worry about it. Anybody else who hadn't gone yet? <laughs> All right. Well, if there aren't any others, I, just don't, I don't want to squash it, though. I mean, this has been a really great testimony time. You know, because we, I'll, I'll say this, we come a lot of weeks, we bring our prayer requests, and that's an important thing to do. But it is, I think, equally important to be able to stand up and go, you know, this is what God's been doing. This is a cool thing I've seen where God's hand is, or I know he carried me through this, or he answered this prayer this way, or whatever. I think that's just as important. So I'm, I'm glad we have these times that are as long or longer than the prayer request time to just talk about what God's doing. That's awesome. But if we don't have any others, then I'm going to ask Victor to come and share the scripture this morning, if you would. Good morning. This reading is from Psalm 85, verses 8 through 13, the New International Version. I will listen to what God the Lord says. He promises peace to his people, his faithful servants, but let them not turn to folly. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Love and faithfulness meet together. 
Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth, and righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good, and our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps. This is the word of God to the people of God. Do we have any prayer requests we'd like to share this morning? Yeah, I don't know if you've been following that on the news, but the wildfires in Hawaii uh, have claimed something like 60 lives already in the last few days. And uh, there are still people in danger and there's still people trying to get out of there. So do pray for the folks in Hawaii with the wildfires. Sure. Brandon, after we left Brooke in Alabama, was praying about a second job so he could fly down and see her often. And he had given up coaching girls basketball and said he would never step into coaching ever again and was very at peace with that. Um, and then our youngest daughter, Kate, as he got out of coaching, she turned more and more into a female version of Brandon and fell in love with <laughs> soccer and was very, came home and said things about the soccer game that sounded like her dad. It definitely wasn't me. And to the point of my prayer request, the soccer coaches resigned at the last minute on Friday and she came home and cried herself to sleep all night long. And so Brandon is stepping back into the ring as a soccer coach <laughs> for boys and girls. So he wanted, me, he wanted me to ask you guys to pray for him. Sure will. I wanted to give everybody an update on mom. Um, she is home and she's doing better. They did an angioplasty on Tuesday to open up some blood flow in her left leg and it seems to be working, but she's still in a little bit of pain and um, can still use your prayers. We came home with physical therapy and a home health nurse, which she wasn't completely thrilled about, but I think it's wonderful. <laughs> um, so just continue to pray for her. She's going to get stronger and I do believe this is the answer and this is going to help her so much and also um pray for the family of joe gursky he lost his battle with cancer yesterday okay gavin was injured friday night at his scrimmage football game um this is his left knee now in the past it was his right and um, he had so much trouble out of his right that he had surgery and um, a six-month rehab and recovery so he we go to the doctor tomorrow we'll be praying sure will anybody else We got a good report, of course, on James, but our older son, Russell, we got to go visit him, and uh, most of his muscle strength is non-existent, but they're working on therapy. They haven't ruled out ALS yet, so I'm praying very hard that uh, that's not going to be the diagnosis. Sure and um got to take care of my three great grandchildren for a week that was exciting yeah <laughs> <laughs> my mom found out why that uh my mom used to say children are for the young and i'd make fun of her <laughs> i know now <clears throat> they are for the young <laughs> but um please keep russell and his wife and kids, they're working very diligently. To, they have to wait hand and foot on him. So uh, his name's Russell Rourke. Thank you. You got it. We sure will. Continue to uh, pray for Billy. He had uh, a CT scan done several weeks ago, and 
he got the results from that. And he's got two or three different things that's wrong with his back. So I'm not sure how they're going to relieve his pain, but keep him in your prayers. Sure will. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, if you didn't catch that all the way, the, for the folks traveling to the laity retreat, we want to remember them both in their travel and that the uh, time there will be good. And uh, we did receive an unspoken request this past week, a uh, pretty serious one that we want to just have you guys lift up. Are there other unspoken requests this morning, I wonder? Yeah. All over. Let's pause for a moment of prayer this morning. God, as we come into your house today, this has been a sweet, sweet place to be already. Lord, your presence is here. We've been worshiping you, and you have honored that with your presence. And Lord, what an incredible gift that is to us. And Lord, how exciting to, to hear the things that you have been doing, the places that we've seen you this past week. And Lord, it's just an amazing thing to know that you are a God who sustains the entire universe that you created and that you still show up in southern West Virginia in places where we can absolutely know it's you. And Lord, that it's not unique that you do that for people all over the world. And truly, you are an incredible God. And we are thankful for that. And Lord, knowing that you care about us as you do, we come with our request this morning. Lord, we think of those folks in Hawaii who are escaping the wildfires, I, I believe, on Maui. And, and Lord, we, we think so often of Hawaii as the, a place where there aren't a lot of problems and a big vacation paradise. And, and Lord, it can certainly be that at times. But Lord, there are people that live and work and make their entire lives there. And Lord, for those folks, the prospect of, of losing everything is no different than when it's happened in our area with floods and storms and those things. So Lord, we pray that you would touch those folks, that you would help th those that are still trying to, to evacuate to be able to escape safely. And Lord, we pray that you would be with the families of those who have lost all of their possessions and Lord, with the families of these 60 or so who have lost their lives. Lord, they need your comfort in a way that they've never needed it before. And Lord, these folks need your peace as they go back to rebuild. Lord, we ask that you would touch them today. Lord, we think of Patty, who's having an MRI on her foot this week. And Lord, we pray that she's not looking at a stress fracture there. And Lord, we know that would mean, I think, a while in a boot and, and uh, other stuff along with it. And Lord, we pray that that would not be the case. We pray that what they find would be the best case scenario. And Lord, that there would not be a lot that needs done to, to get that all taken care of. Lord, we think of Brandon this morning, and Lord, appreciate people like him who step up when there is a need. And, and Lord, in this case, stepping up to coach soccer, which is certainly something that he loves, I'm sure, but Lord, also a big responsibility. Lord, we pray that you would give him wisdom as he coaches, that things would go well. And, and Lord, we also pray that you would touch him and anoint him in every aspect of life, that he would be an example for these kids who, who look up to him and who learn from him, that, that he would shine the light of Christ in all that he does. Lord, we're thankful to hear that Julia is back home and doing better, but Lord, we know she's still in some pain and recovering from the angioplasty this past week. Lord, we pray that you would continue to touch her. Lord, that you would continue to bring her to a place of recovery and wholeness and, and healing. Lord, for the family of, of Joe who lost his battle with cancer this past week, Lord, those, those times are so difficult for families who walk through them. And so Lord, we ask that you would walk alongside them. Lord, that through the, the grief and through the loss, that you would be there to, to pull those folks in close to you, to comfort them as only you can, to give them your peace, and Lord, to help find moments as they share memories and things where they can find joy in the midst of the sorrow. Lord, walk with them through the coming days and weeks especially, and bring them close to you. Lord, for Gavin, we know that he has uh, had another injury this past week, Lord, in a scrimmage, and, and this time the opposite knee from before. 
Lord, we pray that whatever the injury is this time would not be as severe and extensive and require the same sort of recovery as, as last time. Lord, we know he's, he's coming into his senior year and wants to be able to play football, and, and Lord, a lot of things that that could mean for colleges and stuff ahead as well. And Lord, we pray that you would touch him with your healing power. Lord, we also pray that you would encourage him. Lord, remind him that this hasn't escaped your notice and that you're right there with him in the middle of all of it. Lord, we pray as he goes this week to the doctor that, that they would be able to do exactly what needs done to help him to get back to full strength and to restore him. Lord, for we think of Russell this morning, and, and Lord, we know he's been dealing with all sorts of things that the doctors are still trying to pin down. And Lord, we know they haven't ruled out things such as ALS. And Lord, we would pray this morning that that would not be what he is dealing with. Lord, that if it's something else, that it would be something treatable. And Lord, that you would quicken the minds of the doctors as they examine all of this to, to get to whatever the diagnosis is. But Lord, we would pray it would not be that. We pray it would be something that can be treated. Lord, we ask that you would touch him, touch his family this morning, his wife, his children, and Lord, all those who are taking care of him today. Lord, we think of Billy, and we know he had the uh, CT results on his back and came back with multiple issues. And Lord, we pray that there would be a way found that those could be taken care of and that his pain could be relieved. Lord, we ask that you would touch him this morning especially. Cover him with your healing power. Give him relief from this pain. And Lord, give him your peace and your joy this morning as well. Lord, for the folks who are traveling to the laity retreat, we pray that you would keep them safe as they go. Lord, that they would have a fruitful time there and that they would hear good teaching. Lord, we pray that you would touch the bishop as she teaches. And Lord, that you would give her all the words that she needs to have for this as well. Lord, keep them safe as they travel home and, and let what they have learned be something that they can pass on to others. Lord, that it would continue to, to go out and to grow. And Lord, we know we've had an unspoken request this week. And Lord, I know there were hands all over the church when I asked that earlier. Lord, for those things that we carry that are difficult to share, Lord, we pray that you would meet each and every one of those needs. And Lord, that you would meet them quickly. Lord, that you would meet them as only you can. And Lord, as we move ahead in the rest of the service, we pray that you would bind us together in your spirit, bind us together as this congregation. And Lord, draw us together now as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, if the ushers will move into place, we'll continue our worship now with the giving of our tithes and our offerings.
Lord, we pray that you would receive this offering this morning for your glory. Lord, that it would be used for the upbuilding of the church and the upbuilding of the kingdom. Lord, we pray that you would bless each and every one who has given. Bless those who are unable to give this morning as well. Lord, we know that all things come of thee. And Lord, we have given thee of thine own. We ask all this in the name of Christ. Amen. Let's just keep the praise going. Uh, this song is called What We Believe. And in there it says, we will stand unashamed. And so if you feel like when that comes up, you want to stand, please do. Or stand with your hands, stand with your feet. <laughs>
I don't say it because I sing in them. Don't they sound good? <laughs> Enjoy the choir this morning. Well, now we get to hear the rest of you. If you would, if you would stand, please. We're going to sing together number 368. I know this hymn by about 10 different titles. My Hope is Built is the one that's up here. The Solid Rock is the one I've known the longest. But if you would stand and join in the singing, please. be seated. A lot of truth in that song, isn't there? You build your foundation on that rock and it's not going to move. You build it anywhere else, you might as well not build. It's not so much sand today as it is water for Peter, but it's the same sort of idea. If you have your Bibles with you, I'm going to invite you to turn over to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14. We are continuing through parts of the Gospel of Matthew. We sketched out about six weeks or so in there, and we'll see where it goes after that. But it's been interesting to revisit some of these familiar stories. Um, let me ask you this. Have you ever had an experience, you, you were tucking in your child or your grandchild, maybe on a Sunday evening, and you ask them what they learned in Sunday school? Have you done that before? Have you ever, have you ever gotten really fascinating answers before? When Kaylee was real small, uh, she would try to retell a story now and then, and there would be two or three elements that got mixed together. And I, I, I know I did that when I was little, and most kids did. Uh, or they're, you know, they're not sure exactly what it is you're talking about at Sunday school. I heard a story once that this, this teacher was describing an animal, or just, but didn't tell the kids it was an animal. And, and said, you know, what is it that I'm talking about? And said, well, you know, I'm small, and I'm usually gray, and I climb trees, and I have a big tail, and I eat acorns, and all the kids are just looking at her. And one of the kids finally speaks up and goes, teacher, it sounds, I know it's got to be Jesus, but it sounds an awful lot like a squirrel to me. 
So he was paying attention. He had the right idea in his heart because he knew it all kind of went back there, but he had sort of missed the, the, the point of the details on the way around. And the disciples are that way a lot. And they are at moments in this story too. Um, how many of you know that story of Jesus walking on the water? You probably don't have to raise your hands. Most of you have probably known this since you were a kid, the way we've re revisited a lot of these other stories. But it is a pretty fascinating story when it comes right down to it. And it has a lot of depth. Got to dig in there for a minute. There's a lot that this story tells us. There is a lot, and I know we've all heard it. I know we've all heard it. But there's a lot to learn sometimes from hearing it again. And so we're going to revisit it. The scripture is on the screen up here as well. Uh, but if you would like to turn, it's Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 22 and 23. Or 22 through 33. <laughs> It's a long story to cram into two verses. At least it wasn't loaves of fish this week. Um, <laughs> it's a long distance joke to last Sunday. Um, anyway, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14. Beginning in verse 22, the scripture says this. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go out before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Let's pray together. Lord, as we open the word again this morning and open to what is another familiar story, Lord, we pray that you would help us to see it and hear it anew. Or that there would be something in here that maybe we hadn't noticed before. Or some way that you speak to us. Because, Lord, we know the word is living and active. And, Lord, that means when we revisit it over and over, that it is never just dead words. Lord, speak to us through this today. Encourage us today. That as we ride through our own storms at different times, that we will know that you are on the water with us. Lord, flood this place again with your spirit today. And be glorified alone here. We ask this all in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. So we are picking up right where we left off last week. I mean, so it's, we've had the feeding of the 5,000 and then just a couple of other little things that have happened. But, but really the feeding of the 5,000 and then Jesus basically says, go get in the boat and I'm going to go pray. We don't hear that whole exchange. We just know it happened. But when it says immediately he made the disciples get in the boat, that's immediately after the feeding of the 5,000. So we've, we've had the loaves and fish, we've had 12 basketfuls of leftovers, and now the disciples are on the boat, and Jesus has gone to pray. Jesus is tired. His disciples are probably tired. I mean, feeding what is really closer to 10 or 15,000 people. 5,000 only counts the men. We know there were women and children, Matthew says so. So it's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of ten to 15,000 people. You'd be tired too. But Jesus is also, and the disciples too, grieving over the execution of John the Baptist, which happened just before that feeding of the 5,000. This is still fresh news. This is still the same day. You realize that? Jesus gets the news about John and goes out on the boat for a while, and the crowds followed him on foot, and so they park the boat and get out, and he teaches, and he heals their sick, and he feeds the 5,000, and then sends the disciples back out on the boat while he goes to pray, all on the same day. So they're pretty tired. Jesus needs to go 
and do what I think all of us need to do when we get to that place, and that is go spend some time with the Father. Jesus is our example here, and that's what he's done. He's gone to go be alone, and so they have gotten into their boat, and in some translations it says they sailed to a deserted place. They're out there by themselves. It also says that when they went to feed the 5,000, Jesus is out there alone. It's that same sort of thing when he's on the boat trying to be away from everyone, a deserted place in the water, if you can imagine. The Sea of Galilee is not small several miles across and so crowds might be able to see boats from the side but you can get out there pretty far and get out there to where you're very very much alone so then Jesus makes the disciples get in the boat he goes up on the mountain and then it says evening came and he was alone and then it just says in the fourth watch of the night he goes out and he's, there's a gap here Jesus has spent a good amount of time up on this mountain alone because when evening comes, typically when we talk about evening, the Bible is using it the same way. It, evening is starting somewhere between like 5 and 8 p.m., depending on when the sun goes down. That's usually evening. When we talk about the fourth watch of the night, we're talking about between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. the next morning. So the disciples have been out on the Sea of Galilee for seven or eight hours now. And Jesus has been up on that mountain the same amount of time. And so in the wee hours of the morning, Jesus decides he's going to go catch up with the disciples in a way that precisely only Jesus could go catch up with his disciples. Because if your buddies were out on the boat, you're, just, you're not going to go, well, I'm just going to walk out there too. Jesus is the only one who could have possibly done that, and the disciples are having a horrible time. Now let me throw a clue out here. Jesus already knows this. I think sometimes we read this story and we think, well, Jesus discovered this storm. Jesus already knew this. He knew the disciples were going to sail into that thing before he walked up on the mountain. This did not catch him off guard. And so the storm is up. They're being battered by the waves. They're being battered by the wind. They are far away from land. And that's when they spot someone walking on the water. And I think sometimes we read their response and we kind of go, well, that's funny because it's obviously Jesus. Have you ever seen somebody walking on the water before? Would you not react the same way? I mean, if I saw my wife walking on the water to me, toward me on a boat, I would think something had gone drastically wrong. And either I'm hallucinating, or I have died, or she has died. There's been some sort of vision one of us is getting of the other, but none of that is going to be grounded in anything that we've ever seen before, right? And so when the, when the disciples go, it's a ghost, they probably didn't have a much better guess. They didn't know what was happening. So Jesus is coming toward them. But this was Jesus in a way, really, that they'd never seen him. He'd never done this before. You know, I mean, they had seen him do some miraculous things, and they had been following him for a little while now, but really this kind of statement of, I'm going to go walk on a stormy sea of Galilee, is a little different than anything they've ever seen before up to this point. I mean, what kind of being does this, Right? And to get into the mind of the disciples at this moment, because you have to, to really understand where they are, you have to get into their world. You have to get into what they thought. You have to get into the stuff about the sea. These were Jewish men that lived 2,000 years ago, and they thought about things and interpreted things according to their background, according to how they had been taught and how they grew up. It's what we do now. And so that's what they did. And so for them, the water, the sea in particular, would have represented a whole lot more than just the physical reality of the water. Karl Barth, who is a theologian who, if you've never read him, you should. You might not agree with everything he says, I don't, but he's an incredible scholar, and he's right most of the time. And so Karl Barth is talking about this, and he's talking about the Hebrew thought process here. And their principle was that the abundance of power of the ocean was absolutely opposed to the rest of God's creation. So it was already a little weird to be out on the water. You were dealing with this force that in their mind was kind of the opposite of what God had done. It represented evil powers. It represented things that oppressed and resisted what God desired. And the reason that they thought that was because they go all the way back to the beginning of Genesis. What was there before there was creation? The waters. The Spirit of God was hovering over. So when God started speaking, that all started changing. 
The waters were bound together in one place. Dry land appeared. Things grew. Things lived. And water was all of that base primordial stuff that happened before that. And so in their mind, the water is already a little bit opposed to God's purposes and to everything that he had planned. But God proved over and over in Genesis and every other time it came up, his power over those waters. Let there be light, and so now there's not darkness. And let dry land appear, and so it appears. And God goes on to create the world, and then he uses water to destroy the world. Just a few chapters later, saves Noah and his family and no one else. And then by chapter 9, God is making a covenant with Noah saying, I'm never going to destroy all of the earth again and have it cut off by floodwaters. Like they are, are, they've definitely taken this idea of water as being opposed to what God had in mind. In chapter 14 of Exodus, God delivers the Israelite people by doing what? Parting the waters. Joshua chapter 3, they get to the Jordan River. What happens again? parts the Jordan River that time. It was at flood stage at that point, by the way. Pretty wicked river when it's up. Pretty tame river, almost a creek when it's not. But at that point, it would have been pretty dangerous to try to cross, and God split it through his power again. And so that happens over and over. It seems that God is the only one that can triumph over the waters. God tramples the waves in Job chapter 9 and in Habakkuk chapter 3. And we could go on and on and on. But the point is that when Jesus comes walking on the water, triumphing over the sea, we could say, as the disciples are battling the rest of these elements, what it means to these disciples is that this is even a little more terrifying because now Jesus is most obviously doing something that only God can do. And this is perhaps a whole new bit of revelation for them. They've seen him do some other miraculous things, but they, I mean, they've seen some pagan magicians do some things that looked a little miraculous, but this, triumphing over the waters, this is something that only God has accomplished, and, and over and over at that. And then Jesus' words to the disciples are so important, because, I mean, they're already kind of floored. They think it's a ghost, and then he speaks. But his words to the disciples really only reinforce who it is that he's proving he is, which should be an incredible encouragement to us, because check this out. He basically says, you know, don't be afraid. It's me. Be encouraged. It's all right. You know who I am, but what's, it? what's so interesting is when he says, it is I, or it's me, or however it's translated in your Bible, where he identifies himself, he is using a pair of Greek words that are so important, okay? And we have to back up for just a minute into the Old Testament, which was written in Hebrew, but it was translated into Greek at one point, before Jesus ever came around, actually. Um, it, was tra it was translated out so people could use it, because at that point, Greek is what's being spoken. And so run all the way back to Exodus in your mind for just a minute. When God is at the burning bush talking to Moses. And Moses says to God, you know what, you're going to send me to these people. Who am I going to say has sent me? And he says, you tell them that I am has sent you. When the Greek, when you translate that passage back out from the Hebrew into the Greek, that word is ego ami. It means I am. And it's very specific when God uses it. And when Jesus uses it later on. And so when Jesus says to them, it is I, what he says to the disciples is ego ami. In other words, do not be afraid. The I am is with you. He's not just saying, I'm a guy you know. He's saying in his action, walking on the water, and through his verbs to the disciples, I am who I have told you I am. I am exactly who you think I am. The I am is with you. Ruling over the sea ruling over the waves, ruling over the fear. And we live in a world that is pretty dominated by fear, pretty often. You ever turn on the news and there's not some story that makes you worry about something that might happen? If you do, tell me what channel you're watching. I would love to see it. There's always some something, well, this terrible thing could happen if these other circumstances happen. It's like in every news story there is. The world thrives on fear. 
But like those deep, chaotic waters of that sea, it seems to be, fear seems to be the one thing we can't really just overcome. We're afraid of all sorts of stuff. We're afraid of each other. We're afraid of other countries. We're afraid of getting old. We're afraid of being unhealthy or being laughed at or being punished or some secret being found out or of being embarrassed or of losing our loved ones or being alone. Might be afraid of the dark. There are days that we seem to get along just fine. Then there are days that come on us with very little warning, much like this storm, and we get consumed with fear, and then when that happens, it's dark, and we have no idea what to do next, and we wonder how it is that we're going to make it through, but be alert, because Jesus walks out into those storms and walks out to us. These storms that we run up on never catch him by surprise. And if we look and if we watch for him, then we will see him in the middle of all of our chaos. I mean, the disciples are still fighting with this boat. But there he comes, victoriously gliding over the waves and the storms. And then he says, be encouraged. Do not be afraid. The I am is with you. Remember what we're told in 1 John. It says God is love and there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. So then the, really, the question is, when you connect with Christ, what is there left to be afraid of? What is there left that can conquer you? What storms are you fighting this morning? Because Jesus is saying to me and to you and all of us, be encouraged. The great I am is walking with you. Do not be afraid. Well, then Peter, who always has to take things one step further. I love Peter. He's my favorite disciple. Sometimes he's a little impulsive. Sometimes he says things before he thinks about the things he says. I identify greatly with Peter. Just wait. It'll happen. <laughs> but Peter is not content to just receive this word. He's basically saying, okay, if it's you, you tell me to come out there. First of all, that's kind of brave. I mean, sometimes we give Peter a lot of guff for shooting off at the mouth now and then, but this is pretty brave. He's, he's about to take his faith and go, all right, if you're that, then I believe that, and I'm going to come out there. I mean, that, have you ever walked on water before? Any of you? Would any of you have thought to do that? I would have never thought to do that. I like boats. I like to swim. I like water. I would have never climbed out in the middle of a storm, even if I was sure that was Jesus. And Peter doesn't let any of that get in his way. That's really you. Then you let me come out there. In other words, what he's saying is if you are the God that you say you are, then you let me come out there. And so what does Jesus tell him? We get the one word response. Come. And in places like southern West Virginia, it's probably a one word, two word response. Come on. <laughs> I love it here. No, let me say that I grew up in all of, I, I am a West Virginia born and bred, and I've lived in a zillion other places and never lived anywhere that made me sorry to come back here. But little things like that are funny to me. It's a one word, two word response. Come on. So he does. Out the boat he goes. I mean, just, I, I cannot, the audacity of Peter in this moment to just go, all right, I'm going. And off the side of the boat he goes. And, and I think sometimes here we lose the picture for just a minute. Because all we remember most of the time is that Peter got out of the boat and that he sank and Jesus got after him because he doubted. That's not specifically what it says. Do you realize that? That Peter got out of the boat and it says he climbed out of the boat and he walked on the water and went to Jesus. So not only did he get out and take one or two steps, he got out and got all the way to where Jesus was. I mean, this is not... So he didn't get out and immediately plunged. Do you realize that? Peter also walked, albeit a shorter distance. And Peter walked, got all the way to where he was. It was when he was with Jesus, but he let his eyes get on the storm and the things around him, that things turned sour. But he got all the way out there. It was only in that moment of doubt, because he got distracted took his eyes off of where they needed to be and started to worry about everything else. He forgot in that moment, just for a second, who it was that was on the water with him. 
I mean, if you're seeing a guy walk across the water and you think, I'll go out there if he'll let me, and then you get all the way out there, you have no reason in that moment to have to look at the storm anymore. You're doing something you could not possibly do without Jesus standing there in front of you. But we let our eyes get to those things that seem a lot more distracting, and then we lose our footing. It happens so easily. I'm not coming down on anybody. I'm not coming down on Peter. I get that. I wouldn't have even made it over the side. But he sings. But you know what's amazing, though, is the, the, the immediate response of Peter to the sinking and the immediate response of Jesus to the sinking. Because here's the thing. As Peter begins to sink and cries out, the first thing he says, he doesn't call back to the boat. He doesn't lament that he shouldn't have come out there. He just says, Lord, save me. And it, it says Jesus didn't waste any time. He immediately reached down and pulled Peter back up out of the water. You realize that? He pulled Peter back up out of the water. Well, where, how are they going to get back to the boat? He's got to walk some more, doesn't he? Jesus never lets that sinking thing be the end if we call back out to him. You realize that? How many of you have ever stumbled in your life, ever? All right, the ones who didn't raise your hand are lying to me. Okay. Because you do. You get into those storms, you get into those places where everything just seems too big and too hard and you can't keep your focus where it is. Understandably, we get distracted and we have those little hiccups and so we sink a little bit. Do you realize that when Jesus pulls us back up onto the water that we still walk on the water to get back to the boat he sent us out there in? He never leaves us where we stumble unless we let him. And Peter didn't let him. Lord, rescue me. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. What is clear to me in all of this is that we are all called by Jesus to step out of our boats, out of our proverbial comfort zones, even in the midst of what seem to be troubled waters. So what are your troubled waters? You don't have to answer that out loud. It's going to be a different answer for everybody. What are your troubled waters? What storms are brewing? What's hard? And then maybe... This is almost the scarier question. What ministry is it that you think God is calling you to? And does it seem like that's just a, that's a storm you're just not willing to sail your boat in the middle of? So the thought of it frighten you? Or are you stepping out in faith anyway? I read this from, uh, it's actually not that long ago, I read this from a colleague of mine. And he said, years ago I attended a gathering where a pastor was talking to a group of other pastors about crisis in our churches. He says, I will always remember that his assertion was that the reason that we seem to lack faith in our particular time is that we're not doing anything that requires it. It hits hard, doesn't it? God is calling us to something and it feels just a little too far. It takes faith to do that. It takes climbing over the side of the boat. Got to chase Peter out there onto the water. If we don't have to exercise our, our faith in that way, then maybe we're not doing anything that pushes us out that far. And that doesn't seem to be where God ever calls us. He doesn't call us to safe harbors all the time. Make no mistake, the, the Christian life is not safe. It is good. It's one of my favorite quotes from C.S. Lewis. If you've ever read the Chronicles of Narnia ever, are you familiar with these at all? The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe and those stuff. You have to know, if you've never read them, you have to know that all the creatures in Narnia, I mean, all of this is sort of playing out as a big allegory of God versus the enemy, good versus evil. And the lion character, Aslan, is the Christ figure in this story. And at one point, one of the kids who finds his way through the wardrobe asks one of the other people in the woods if Aslan, who is a lion, is safe. And he just looks at him and he goes, is he safe? Said, of course he's not safe but he's good. Folks, our, our call is never to sit where it is always safe. Our call is that even in the middle of stormy seas that we follow a God who may not be safe, but he is good. And he is the I am. Which means he always is. Which means he is not 
changing, which means as good as he was in the scripture is as good as he is now, which is immeasurably good. And that he is, you have not escaped his notice. The all-powerful God that we see here is the all-powerful God that we worship in this room this morning. He is the one that walks with you through your storms. He is the one that calls you out into the storm. He is the one that calls you to walk off the side of the boat. And he is the one that when you sink in the water even just a little bit, is there to pull you back up so that you can keep walking on top of that thing that you thought might kill you. You follow him. If Peter had not, this is another, this is a Methodist bishop. I'm going to close with this thought. It's not ours. This is a retired bishop named William Willimon. Wrote a number of books and said a lot of interesting things. Said a few things a little later in his career that I'm less excited about. But a lot of really, really good things. And this is one thing that he wrote. He said, if Peter had not ventured forth and had not obeyed the call to walk on the water, then Peter would have never had this opportunity for recognizing who Jesus was and the opportunity to be rescued by him. And if you want to be close to Jesus, you have to venture forth out onto the sea, trusting and proving his promises through the risk and through the adventure. Folks, that's our call today. It is not to sit in the boat. It is not to paddle around in the shallow end and sit in the calm seas. You've got to take off your life jacket once in a while to steer into the places that Christ leads us, stormy or not, and be willing to step out of the safety of our boats if necessary. Folks, that is just what Jesus invites us to do. So let me say this. I'm going to close very briefly and just say, if you need his help with that, because you can't do it without it, first of all. Peter would have never made one step if Jesus hadn't been standing out there. So don't go bailing out your boat if Jesus is not on the water. If he's out there, you go to where he is, even if it means leaving your boat behind. And if you need help with that, have no fear, because the I am is here. And he's ready to meet you. He is ready to help you. He is ready to walk with you and to catch you in those moments of doubt. Amen? You follow him today. All right. I'm going to have you stand as we get ready to close. And I would just say again that... I used to say the altar is open. We don't really have a rail, but an altar is really just a dedicated place of prayer. So if you need to pray today about this or about anything else, you come up. I'll meet you here. We'll pray together as we sing hymn number 534, Be Still My Soul.
Let me briefly remind you that the uh, combination admin, finance, and trustees meeting in the library right after the service. So if you're on those committees, please head that way pretty shortly. And I believe that's all. So let's close now with our benediction. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in the knowledge of the love of God the Father and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain in you now and always.